Um, I'm delighted to introduce someone who checks all of those boxes, uh, Professor Thomas Gideon of the Department of Mathematical Sciences. I'll say a little more about you before you um, Thomas uh, is professor in mathematical sciences and a member of the Center for Computational Biology. He joined the faculty here in 1994. His contributions to a wide range of applied mathematical problems are nationally and internationally recognized. In the last few years, he's published important papers in mathematical neuroscience, systems biology, and mathematical biology, and has developed an international reputation for his excellent and insightful contributions to the understanding of the structure and function of biological systems. Tomas is a prolific publisher with 69 papers published in many of the most prestigious journals available to applied mathematicians. He has a sustained and impressive record of grant funding. He's had been PI on NSF and NIH grants totaling 1.2 million and co-PI on grants totaling 4.3 million. Very impressive for um, someone in mathematics. He's served as an associate. <laughs> no, I don't mean that. <laughs> Discipline of mathematics, that kind of funding record is simply outstanding uh, because the availability of funding in that field is not nearly as great as uh, many of the other fields that NSF and NIH fund. Um, Tomas has been an associate editor of two math journals. He served on multiple NSF panels. Um, and he's recognized as a dedicated me mentor uh, to many students, from freshmen to graduate students. He's graduated nine PhD students under his supervision in the last nine years, and he's currently advising the board. Um, in 2010, he received the Cox Family Award for Creative Scholarship and Teaching, as well as the Letters and Science Dean's Award for Meritorious Research and Creativity. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Thomas Gideon, our distinguished professor. Thank you very much. I hope this works. Uh, microphone. Uh, this is a great honor for not just me, but the math department in general uh, to be recognized uh, on a college level uh, at this level. Um, and so, you know, it's very friendly and, and uh, in the great department, a great place to live, a great place to, to work. Um, so today, I want to talk in general about mathematics and biology and how those two things can interact and, and talk to each other. I have some, ah, this works. So, um, what is mathematics? I want to kind of put a prime uh, here, uh, uh, a foot down and say mathematics is much, much older than anything else. Um, so this is the first mention, in, in my opinion, of mathematics, which goes back 3,600 years. Uh, and it tells you what mathematics is. It's accurate reckoning uh, into an inquiry into things, which is everything, which is the whole science. and. Um, so, so at that point, that was the science. Right? Uh, biology, and this is my view of biology, um, it's, much more, it's much more complex in some sense in mathematics. Uh, it's interested in multiple levels of, of uh, uh, you know, biological system, from ecosystem individuals, all the way to, and this is, oops, I'm actually, ah, see the red dot? Awesome. So uh, all the way to kind of small molecular interactions and the problem when you try to talk about molecular, mathematical biology is that mathematics wants to be precise. And biology has this kind of leveling of, level of complexity. So if you try to come and say, I'm going to talk about genes, there must be things which you're forgetting because all of this kind of stuff underneath that uh, <clears throat> on a level, small level is going to be somewhat uh, uh, vague or some, somehow fuzzy. So there's, that's kind of a challenge in this field. So, uh, here's what I'm going to talk to you about uh, today. So the main theme is how, what is mathematics bringing to biology? What is modeling? Um, what do we do? What do I do? And I'd like to tell you three stories, actually four stories. Three will be successful stories, and one will be kind of a challenge, uh, very kind of what, what, what we do not know how to do at this point. Um, success is 
I consider this particular first story, which is not mine, this is something which happened maybe 10 or 15 years ago, a great example of interaction between quantitative think thinking and experimental biology. And uh, this was, the question is, what happens in the 10 years before the acute infection of a person by HIV virus and the full blown age, which is kind of a terminal part of a disease? There's this kind of a quiet period. And uh, in the early, well, I'll talk about it later. Okay. So that's the first question. Okay. The second, and these, the second and third will be something which I worked on and people in the room worked on. I'll talk about microbial consortia. This is a joint work with uh, folks in uh, chemical engineering, Ross uh, Carlson's lab. Um, and this very interesting and simple question is if you take a metabolism of a bacteria and you split it into two, and I'll explain what that means, uh, into two organisms, what happens to those two organisms? Uh, and how that affects the kind of the health of the of, of, of the ecosystem, the small ecosystem of two two different bugs. I will talk about transcription elongation. And you notice there's different levels here, right? HIV infection is somehow individual viruses, individual cells. Uh, the consortia again is between the cells. The third one, this is what happens inside of the cell. This is how DNA is being copied into um, messenger RNA. And I will try to uh, put in a framework of how quickly can an E. coli grow. Right? We kind of know that if you put a sugar uh, bath and you know, E. coli, the sugar bath, they grow about, they can divide every 20 minutes. But why they don't divide every 10 minutes or every 10 seconds? Is there some limitations and why, why are there some kind of a, a bounds on this? So we'll do some modeling of that sort. And I'll talk about um, a very general question, which is you know, analysis of complex systems with many, many variables, many, many degrees of freedom. And this could be uh, gene networks, this could be uh, brains, this could be uh, global warming, uh, the atmosphere. How do, you, how do you think about systems which is very, very many weak parts, okay? Um, what is a mathematical model? You start with some kind of reality, and I get my complexity of this reality, multilateral reality, and you translate it into some mathematical symbols, uh, which represent part of that reality. What is the goal? What, what, what do you expect from this? Well, I don't, I don't expect, and people kind of think this is what should happen. They would like to exactly describe what happens in the biology. That is not feasible, and even not desirable, I think. Uh, if you try to make a copy of a brain in silicon, okay, you are, please. <laughs> um, you end up in an extremely complex system of, I don't know, differential equation, whatever you make, which is as complex as the one which you, which you left, and you, you still don't know anything. Right? So, so, the, so the, the idea is that you need to simplify, you need to, you need to kind of a priori say, okay, I think the main parts of this are these four pieces, okay? And everything else I'll forget. And then you'll say, okay, um, Let's try to test it. Right? You don't know which ones are essential. So you just try these four, and you see if what you get out of the model is, you know, is looking like a reality. If it doesn't, it's actually very good, because you know you have to include something else. This is not sufficient. You actually learn something. Uh, so you have to iterate this process. You go, oh, it doesn't work. I strip it too much. Let's add something in and try to iterate. Right? So this is kind of the process which, which I think of as being a model. Uh, so let's move to the first example. Okay. Anytime you have a question, let me know. Okay. If, if there is, I, I would rather tell you not four stories, but three stories to tell you well than you know, if, I, if I lose you. So here's, a, here's a something from, oops, wrong button. This is from a, by now, a book. Right? This, is, this is already a, a known uh, digested science here. Um, what you see here is here, uh, the, the timeline here of infection uh, uh, by HIV virus. And the red line, which this is the, the line here, is HIV RNA. This is the copies of how many RNAs are in the blood, approximately. And on the other side, is the, this is the, kind of the T cells, the CD4 plus T cells, which are the cells, which are both uh, the immune cells, which kill the virus, but are also being attacked by the cells. And that's the part of the HIV which is And what you see here, is that there's a huge kind of a, a, a acute, acute phase of the disease 
which lasts only a few weeks. This is like a flu or something. You cough, you feel, you know, it's not very, but then it dies out, comes back down. And for years, and this is weeks, for years, things are laying low, okay? Nothing as much is happening. Uh, and your count is, CD4 count is pretty high, and uh, the HIV is low, almost undetectable, okay? And it was not detectable in the time in the, in the 90s. So the, so the thought was, um, was the following. If you cannot find those viruses, they're probably hiding someplace. They're hiding in your big toe, or they're hiding in your ear, or the brain, or someplace. And it, it doesn't make sense to treat the disease, because you will never, you know, the, 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 the chemical agent will never find it, okay? That's one idea. This is kind of the assumption. And this assumption proved to be radically wrong, and I'd like to show you uh, how we came up, uh, how we came, came to that uh, idea. So here's what biologists, or mathematicians, do and think about it as kind of a first iteration of the model. So uh, what this is saying, I'm going to, I'm going to look at um, this diagram, okay? So I'm stripping away a lot of complexity here, and I think of this as being what is important for this for this for this for this biological situation. So what is the what is the what, what do I strip it to? There's I will be there's some infected cells, which are the CD4 T cells. There are some cells which are not yet infected, but which can be targeted by virus. This arrow means, well, these cells produce viruses. They butt off and they come to the environment, right? So there's a, some rate in which that happens per day. There's a rate P in which these cells re, you know, release viruses. Then there are viruses. They get cleared by immune system. I don't know why I'm pushing the wrong buttons here. They get cleared by the immune system at some rate. It's the killing of the viruses. Uh, but some of them will come through and attack new cells. These cells, in, in turn, will, with some rate K, not every cell will actually get infected, but with some rate K, this will become an infected cell. And then these arrows, delta C, and these, these are just death rates. There's like, you know, the cells are dying, viruses are being cleared out. And then also there is an influx of new cells with body producing new cells. Now, I'm ignoring all of the biophysics inside of how the virus comes in and injects the DNA and what happens. In the, no, okay? I'm going, to, I'm going to assume this is all there is. Okay? Um, and uh, so let's translate it into mathematics. So this is the last really mathematical slide, but I want to show you at least a little bit of mathematics, okay? So uh, think about this as being three bank accounts, okay? Uh, that's my analogy of what is the kind of differential equation. So there will be three bank accounts, which is P, this is number of, of uh, the uninfected target cells. There will be I, I'll track this, these three bank accounts, okay? I, which is the number of infected cells. And finally, there will be uh, B, the number of viruses. These three bank accounts are changing in time. Right? There's, you look at these things, things are moving in, things are moving out at every single time. Uh, and the, the rates are described <coughs> in that diagram, right? So I would like to write this and make it into mathematics. Differential equations is one language which one can use to describe this balancing of the accounts. Okay? So here's the, this is the last differential equation here. So bear with me. So here's how I, how I write, how I translate this diagram into, into symbols. Something. So this right here says, this is a DTD, this is a derivative of T, number of infected cells. Change, this is how, this is the rate of change of that bank account, right? Which is T, unaffected cells. And there's, what contributes to that T? Well, there's a lambda, which is a new source coming in. That's a positive thing, so it's a positive. Okay. But there's a negative part, which is the death rate. So there's a D, there's a decrease, the cells are dying. There's a certain rate at which they die, so this is the minus. There's another minus, which is the K part, when the virus and the uninfected cells connect, this is the likelihood of their, of their finding each other, with the rate K, the T becomes I. Right. And that term is also over here, but now with a positive sign because this is increasing the account I, the infected cells, and it's decreasing the account of T, the uninfected cells. This is transfer from one to another. Okay? The other term here, which is this one, is a production, this is a P, production of viruses from the infected cells at some rate. And then the other one, that this is a death rate of the infected cells, and this is the clearance rate of the viruses. Very, very simple. So that diagram is something which you 
constructing your brain, and then you just say, okay, here's my differential equation. So now mathematicians come in, and they have methods to either solve this, and by solution it means finding exactly how each account evolves in time, how much there are, how much, how much money there is, how much unexpected <coughs> virus is, is each in account of the function of time, based on these relationships. So one can do that, and if you do that, um, you can just start asking some questions. And here's a very clever way how you can ask interesting questions. So first you say, okay, in that middle portion of the, of the um, infection, things are in a steady state. There's a set point. Okay? Things are, there's no increase or decrease of anything. And so in that point, uh, the, the, uh, there should be um, what has to happen, I'm sorry, sorry. There's a balance between the P, which is a rate of new uh, viruses coming in, and CV, which is the clearance rate of the viruses. Right? So the virus, the influx of the viruses and outflow of the viruses must balance. Okay? So if I look at that, uh, <coughs> so these are the, you know, total, the numbers are in there. Now, one has to realize that if you are looking at the value of that account, so if you look at how much viruses are, are in the blood, it tells me nothing about C or P, a rate, okay? Think about it this way. I'm looking at a count of a uh, uh, Chicago mobs, mobster, okay? Every week, there's a billion dollars coming in, a billion dollars coming out. And if you look at how much is it left in there, it's like 20 bucks, okay? Or you can look at a count of 99% uh, of US population or us, you know, MSU professors, and there's every month trickle coming in, and then when trickle coming out, right? and, and there is 20 bucks in the account. <laughs> so, so both of these, from the level, you cannot tell me the rate of in and out. Right? Now how do I, but those are very important quantities, the CMV, because that tells me how quickly, how much virus is being produced, how much is being killed. Okay? So, um, I have my pictures of this. Right? This is your gangster. A lot of stuff coming in, a lot of coming out, or trickle and a trickle. Which one happens? How do I, how do I detect this? You introduce a perturbation. Okay. So to find which one is which, which one of those two is happening, you introduce a perturbation <coughs> in the following sense. Uh, this is in 95, the first time they come up with these protease inhibitors, which can stop temporarily, not for long, because the virus will, will adapt. But they, they can, uh, they can uh, stop production of new viruses for a few weeks. So what that means is that I can look at this picture and take that out. There's no influx coming in. And so at this point, I can very quickly see if you're a gangster or you are uh, somebody normal. Because what happens, if you're a gangster, the account goes like And it's gone in a few minutes, right? because the out outflux is still the same. Well, if you are somebody who just trickles in, trickles out, it will take a while for the account to draw down. So that's the idea, and you can actually do this, right? So uh, you can you cross the P out. There's no P in, and you just look at the, uh, the decay of number of amount of virus in time, and you fit into these data points the solutions of the differential equation which I, which I, which I pointed out. And then what you find, you find the C, the rate of clearance of the virus, right? how quickly things move out. So what happens? What happens if you compute this, you realize that the half-life of HIV virus is between, is in minutes. It's, the mean is one hour. So the, this is kind of the expected lifetime of a virus in the human body. So this is not your hiding for 10 years in a, in a toe, in a big toe. This, this is not it, okay? It's much different. They live very, very short lifestyle. So for that to happen, um, and we have to kind of start counting on how much the virus is being produced every day. We can multiply things by you know, our plaza and how much it's produced. There is about 10, uh, uh, over there, 10 to the 10 virus particles produced every single day in an HIV patient. Okay? So this is a massive, you know, this is massive gangster kind. There's a lot of stuff coming in, a lot of things being killed out. And there's very little things left, left over. Right? So this is the real, real situation. Now that gives you multiple uh, conclusions, right? Because now you need to treat people at that time, right? Because this is, there's a huge cosmic battle happening 
in every single day over those 10 years where you know, viruses are trying to reproduce as quickly as you can and, and the immune system is, trying, is holding them off. Okay? 10 years, the immune system gets basically tired. Okay? But there's important other things which, which happen. You can compute the HIV genome is about 10 to the 4 bases. Well, this is a very, very short genome. Okay? And, the, and there's a very high mutation rate of, at each base pair. So if you put this together, what you find is that in every single day, a single base pair mutant will happen in your body. Okay? <laughs> and the majority of double base pair mutants will happen. So this rate is so quick right, that every possible mutant which can possibly happen will happen every day multiple times. So if you try to treat by a drug, it will escape in a few days right? or a weeks because it will, it will run through every possible way how to get escape, it will find, find those things. So that's why you need to treat um, by more drugs. This is where the, the drug cocktails and all this stuff uh, came from. Right? You need to treat multiple things because then the chance of escaping it, of, of this drug is much more small because you need seven or 10 uh, uh, mutations or maybe more to get there. Right? And by the time you make those seven, eight mutations, that takes a week or two weeks and you're dead, or viruses are dead. Right? At least that's the idea. That's the first story, okay? Let me make my time here, let's see what happens, okay? Let's see we get all through all the stories. So again, what I would like to um, emphasize here is that there's an interaction. You realize that you need to find these uh, decay constants, these, um, these clearance rates, and you find, oh, this is a drug which can get at that constant if I do this experiment. So it's both experiment and the quantitative thinking. So here's a uh, <coughs> joint work with uh, uh, people in chemical engineering, Ross Carlson lab, uh, Jeff Hayes, Emily Harv is a postdoc, and Hans is sitting in the back there doing all the experiments. Um, <coughs> microbial communities. This is something which is uh, increasingly understood as being very important to human health and other issues. Uh, we know that a human gut, every one of us carries about three pounds of microbes in our guts. And they are very happily living and talking to each other. There's a huge variety of, 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 uh, kind of collaborative uh, <clears throat> interactions between them. And if this goes wrong, it goes wrong badly. Right? So antibiotics, all this stuff. Uh, we don't understand even a even little bit of this, how it works. Okay? Uh, but you can also uh, use these uh, communities water treatment plants, remediation of toxic uh, sites, and so forth. Majority, my understanding is the majority of these, of these tasks uh, are currently being done by a single microbe. We understand very well how you, you, build, build, you know, make one E. coli that does something well, you put it in there. But it's much better if you make uh, <coughs> multiple microbes which can talk to each other with the ecosystem, because they seem to be more robust than monocultures. Uh, they seem to produce more biomass. So if I want to uh, produce some penicillin or something like this, I need to make a lot of microbes which will produce a lot of stuff. Um, and we don't understand how these, how these behaviors, which I call uh, you know, the, the robustness and the, and the biomass production, emerge from the interactions. Right? We do not understand these communities. So what... Um, would like, what, what the experiment which Ross was doing is, is very simple. We just try to make a community which is very, very well controlled and, um, and try to understand a very small community. So <clears throat> the, we'll have a two species consortium. So we'll just make two E. coli, different E. coli bacteria, which will talk to each other and live in, in the same, same space. And the observation which we would like to explain is that these two species will have higher biomass than one species. I'll tell you how the, how the two species are made from one species in a second because they're very, very close to the Now, I'd like to understand, so there's a, this is like a cartoon of a one species, a few bugs, and a lot of species, and a lot of stuff, there's more. Okay, so, this is, that's, so let me try to explain a picture here. So this is a metabolism of an E. coli. Um, <clears throat> so WT stands for wild type. This is a regular E. coli. And among other things, which is thousands of different things, uh, E. coli eat, eats glucose. That's a preferential food source. Uh, and then if, if there's a lot of glucose, 
It can really digest all the oil, so it produces acetate. Then it can also eat the acetate. It has the has ability to digest it as well. But too much of acetate is going to not be very good for it. Okay. So this uh, little arrow with the with the kind of bar like this says that's not good for you. It's not healthy. Okay. So the all the arrows in biology, oops, which uh, are pointy or like upregulation is positive, and uh, dull arrows are bad. Okay. So so this particular. The acetate is both good for it because it can eat it, but also it's going to suppress growth at higher, higher concentrations. Uh, <clears throat> the, the reason why that is the case, it will just make things uh, acid, right? I mean, the acid environment collect and grow. So instead of this really uh, simple metabolism in a regular E. coli, we can make two different microbes and split this metabolism into two, two different pieces. So in the microbe one, I'm going to uh, <coughs> it's a regular E. coli, except that all the acetate eating part is going to be knocked out. This E. coli will not be able to eat acetate. Okay? Therefore, uh, it produces acetate, but it can't eat it. The second microbe, I'm going to take the glucose eating part and knock that out to eat also. So this other guy is only eating acetate, but not glucose. Okay? So it's the same metabolism, but just split into two. One only glucose, the other one only acetate. And <clears throat> this forms a nice little kind of uh, a feeding uh, chain, right? There's a microbe one, which eats glucose, produces acetate. The second microbe eats acetate and lives off of the kind of effluent of the first one. So uh, what happens here? Differential equations, okay? Again, accounting. So I'm going to try to account and I'm going to run this through this very quickly because this, we already have done this. Uh, what are my, my accounts which I need to look at, which are flowing in and flowing out? I'm going to look at microbe one, this is for two species. Microbe two, glucose and acetate. And I simply say, okay, so the microbe one, there's some function, there's some growth function. This is the growth part. Uh, it's going to grow on glucose and there will be a f influence by acetate which will be uh, generally bad, right? So this, fun this is a function, and I'll show you the function in a second slide. The second bug only eats acid. This is the glucose eating guy, which acetate is going to diminish that eating. So this is going to be negative influence. Uh, this is going to be a function of X2, which is going to eat glucose, eat acetate, uh, <coughs> uh, and be also diminished at high concentration. And then I just say, okay, so glucose, uh, glucose has some uh, washout rate, it's being consumed by first bug, and then the acid is being consumed, being produced by the first one, there's a plus, being consumed by the second. It's very, very simple the counting of this diagram. Okay? Very similar to one which we saw before. And then <coughs> the same thing you can do for the one <coughs> ecosystem. So this is an ecosystem of two bugs versus ecosystem of one, one E. coli. And, the, and what I'm going to assume is that when I split, so this right here, pay attention to this one, one little piece, is that this is my wild type E. coli, and that is going to grow on glucose and acid at the same time. So these two pieces, which are split between two different microbes, are here sitting on a one microbe. Okay? So my assumption is going to be that when I split these two things to, uh, apart, I'm just splitting these two functions into one versus the second microbe. That's it. Okay? That's my main assumption and how I do this. So then uh, I make some assumptions, further assumptions. And the assumptions are very, very simple. You take the growth curve with glucose. It says if you have more glucose, you grow more. This is an increase in function. You say uh, uh, if you have more acetate, you grow less. This is the bad form. This is bad influence. And this is the growth of the second uh, uh, microbe, which says for some rate range of acetate, you, are, you like it because you need more food. But then after some range, you don't like it anymore. The growth rate goes down. The value of this one is a growth rate uh, because you're getting poisoned. And I'm just assuming that the curves look like this. There's no expression. So one is going like this, go down, up, down. That's all I want to say. Then you make analysis, which I will not tell you about. Okay. Uh, which Emily is still working on a little bit. Uh, this is not so simple. But here's what you conclude. You conclude that with those assumptions, consortiums of two different microbes together, 
have always smaller biomass than one of the microbes. With, with those functions and splitting of the thing. So then you come back and you ask uh, Hans for data. And this is what happens. Okay, so here's, let me just go back. Uh, what you see in these columns, uh, this is the regular, this is the biomass, and how they measure it, it's a different story. This is the, uh, how much biomass there is for one, one E. coli, this is for the binary, for the two of them. Two of them have more mass. You do one more experiment with uh, in the biofilm, one bug, two bugs. Hmm. Hmm. I proved the theorem, <laughs> which says this is not true. <laughs> and you know, math theorems are theorems. <laughs> so this is completely, this disagrees. This is wrong. So I'm going to go down and cry, or I'm going to be excited about it. <laughs> I'm going to be excited about this. Here's the reason why I'm going to be excited about this. So good, bad model, so failed model is actually very, very good. Okay? And here's the reason why. Because I prove the theorem, which has assumptions. Some of those assumptions must be wrong. And I know what those assumptions are. Right? Because if, if I have those assumptions satisfied, the theorem is done. It's true. It is not true. Assumptions must be wrong. So here is some best candidate for those assumptions which could be wrong. But I told you that we just took, took this E. coli and split, the, split it to two pieces. That's an assumption. What really happens is that when they do experiment, they make the genetics, genetic change. And I don't know how that does. You know, just do something, right? <laughs> they take that E. coli from acetate, <coughs> grow it for 100 generations, kind of slow it on the side so they kind of, you know, it, it kind of recovers from the operation. The same for the glucose eating guy, right? Now, in that in that situation, it is very very easy to imagine that they will adapt to their new source, right? I eat. I am sitting on a, on a great acetate source. There's nobody to compete with. I'm going to say, oh, this is my good food. Let me adapt to that food, adapt to the other food. That means that the split is not really a split which is neutral, but when you split it, you have to up the growth rate in both of these guys. That's one of the suggestions which this has that that could happen. Whether it either happens or not, we have to go on to experiments. Okay? And that, that, that we haven't done yet. Okay? So again, mathematical model <coughs> gives a suggestion of what could go wrong. Right? What, what could be the culprit for, uh, <coughs> for that disagreement. Right? So now it's kind of what we to do uh, to, do, to do the next step, I think. Okay, we're good. All right, <clears throat> next story. This is the third success story. Okay. Um, this is modeling a transcription process in E. coli or generally bacteria. And this is John's work with uh, colleagues in the math department, graduate students, and uh, another graduate in the computer science department. Um, <clears throat> okay, here's the basic biology, which probably we all know. Uh, how does a cell make a protein? It takes, you take a DNA, that's where information is stored, and then you run it through this machine, which is quite complicated, which is called <coughs> RNA polymerase. And that's a transcription process. You produce a copy of DNA, which is messenger RNA. Then you have this, uh, another remarkable uh, machine, which is called ribosome, which takes that and produces a polypeptide, which is this kind of string, string of amino acids, which folds into a protein. That's 90% of what we do and what we have when we build on that protein. This is how it works. That's a central bottom line. This is how it works. Well, this can. Okay. So, um, how quickly can I do this process? What's the turnover here? That's a question I'd like to ask. Um, apparently, this is you know, Ken Bill from Cornell. Uh, what happened? This is this pro in this process. There's a place where you come and you put these amino acids together like this, right? And that, you know, doing that bond takes about 15 milliseconds, 150 milliseconds. There's, there's a limit to it, okay? In the ribosome, this machine is essentially unchanged since it's about to humans, if I understand this correctly, right? So we figure out, the life figure out how to do this once, but we couldn't figure out a better, better way to do it, right? So uh, that is where you can do things faster. 
but you still want to grow fast. So how do you do that? Right? You need to produce proteins. You need to grow. You need to do a lot of proteins. Uh, and there is upper bound of how quickly this, this, ch this chain can grow. One statistic is if you had one ribosome, let me do, let me do the next point, right? you cannot make a faster ribosome. Let's make a lot of these machines. Let's do things in parallel. Okay? So um, <clears throat> apparently if you count, if you compute this, if I have one E. coli, and if it, if, if it, if it only uses one ribosome to copy all the, to make all the proteins it needs for to division, it will take about 2,000 years for E. coli to divide. In reality, it's 20 minutes. Okay? So it cannot do it with one ribosome. It makes lots and lots of ribosomes and does the uh, translation in parallel. So how many? So here's the, here's the ribosome. Uh, <clears throat> again, it's a remarkable machine. What you see here uh, is it's a mixture of proteins and actually D or RNA, just the ribosomal nucleic acid. Okay? So yellow or brown are pieces of RNA, and there are three pieces in this, and that they have just some names. And then there is protein, which are all the blue pieces, which is about 50 different proteins. So it's a very, very large and complex machine. Um, these two pieces kind of join together, and there's a little green piece uh, on this one right there, which is the place, which is a magical place where the polymerization takes place. Uh, they kind of assemble and then they run around the uh, <clears throat> So again, let's go back to this question, how do you divide fast? You have to make uh, a lot of these ribosomes, these big machines. So there are two pieces. There's these proteins, and there's a ribosomal RNA. What is known is this, the ribosomal proteins have a simple negative feedback in a way that if you need them, you produce them. If you don't need them, you will not produce them. And the need here is determined by the ribosomal RNA. So produce this ribosomal RNA, which is just, you copy a piece of DNA. It doesn't get translated into protein. It just kind of comes up, folds, and that's a scaffold on which all these other proteins come together and make a ribosome. If you have a scaffold available, you make more proteins to, to cover them. If you don't have scaffolds, you lower the production of proteins. So the essential piece which determine how many ribosomes you make is this ribosomal RNA. There's one single gene. It's called operon because it actually has three pieces, the 16S, 23S, and 5S. Those are three different pieces. And they are being transcribed all at once. You make them. This kind of comes in there. One, one piece, second piece, third piece, and then you make a ribosome out of this. That's my. Uh, but that's my uh, explanation. So how do, how do you make a lot of this ribosomal RNA? I'm trying to focus on that, on that bottling. How do you make a lot of this stuff? Uh, well, you have to trans transcribe a lot of the stuff. So you put a lot of machines. So this is an actual picture. Okay? What you see here is this copy of this gene. It starts over here, goes all the way up to here. Every single dot is a copy machine making a copy of that ribos of that of that DNA. Okay? What you see here, these little Christmas tree like things, this is a piece of DNA which has been trapped ah, back back. Okay? Um, which has been translated. So this is every one of these black dots is one of the machines. They go like this. Make a lot of copies at the same time. And they speed out those pieces and they're already being now kind of folded and molded into the, the basis of the ribosome. Okay, so let me try to review the biology here, what we have done so far. Here's the RNA. If you make a lot of copies of that, you make a lot of ribosomes. If you make a lot of ribosomes, <coughs> you have fast growth. Because a lot of ribosomes produce a lot of proteins. Okay? So in the evolution, if, um, if you're E. coli, if you grow faster than your neighbor, you dominate the world. Right? So this is, this is the, the essential pathway which will make make that happen. So now I look at the Christmas tree and I realize, well, there's a lot of these things that are moving it together. They look like a traffic jam. <coughs> Every time you have a traffic, there's two, there's two problems which happen with traffic. There's a traffic jam. Aren't you happy with the wind in San Francisco? Or, <laughs> um, and the red lights. Right? So things just, you know, there's these two pieces. And, and the question is, do they happen at the, at the level of, uh, of the ribosomal RNA? And there's um, my video. For the first time, Japanese researchers have conducted a real-life experiment that 
that shows how some traffic jams appear for no apparent reason. They placed 22 vehicles on a single track and asked the drivers to cruise round at a constant speed of 30 kilometers an hour. At first, traffic moved smoothly, but soon the distance between cars started to vary and vehicles clumped together at one point on the track. But the jam spread backwards around the track like a shockwave at a rate of about 20 kilometers an hour. Real life jams move backwards at about the same speed. Traffic jams happen even if you don't want them to happen. Okay? They happen because you have high density. Uh, the second portion of this is actually measurements, and I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, when, they, when they look at these polymerases uh, running on, on DNA, what they realize is that they stop sometimes. So every one of these little horizontal, this is a time, and this is space, along which this works like a track. And every time I have a horizontal line, I don't change place, but I change time. So this is like a pause. Things just moving, there's like, eh, move, stop, move, stop. Uh, and you can measure how often they stop. This is kind of a stochastic, nobody actually understands why this happened. There's a lot of research on this. Maybe it's a backtracking of this polymerase, maybe it just, it just stops, right? Um, so there is, there's a data of how much there's 1.2 seconds, 6 seconds means of, of how, these, how often these pauses are, how often they enter a pause, and then there's also data of how long this operon on average takes to transcribe. So there's a lot of data on what kind of, where it should be. And so there's both traffic jams uh, because of high density and, and these red lights. So this is a mathematical problem now. Question is how, how these uh, pauses in high density affect the transcription? Is this something which actually limits uh, the E. coli uh, growth rate? Okay, so we'll make a simple model, which I will not describe in detail uh, at all. But the simplest model you can make is this kind of this kind of model. You say, well, there's this polymerase, which is this object, which is this is DNA. There's a rate at which things move on. There's this kind of hopping rate at which you hop to the next slot, provided it's empty. Right? If it's occupied, you cannot go. That's the that's where the traffic jam comes to. And so there's a name for this, which is very long and complicated. In the physics literature, they thought about this for 20 years in a different context. I call it hop if you can model. Right? <laughs> That's a stochastic model. And you, I want to make it simpler. So what we do, I try to explain this, this process here a little bit. Uh, we try to blur the details here by moving it away from this picture. So let me try to if I can do this, right? So if I go further away, I, I don't see any more of those little, these little bars and stuff. I just see little dots kind of on a piece of line. If I go even further, what I see is instead a density. Okay? Well, there's a bunch of these guys over here, a bunch of these polymerases over here, a little bit over here, and this, there's a function, just a continuous function. So this is a continuous now space instead of the discrete hop places, and there's a density which evolves in time. And you can write now a differential equation uh, for that that uh, object, which is a density in time and space. Okay. And that differential equation, um, again, this is a partial differential equation, uh, says the you know, derivative of that thing with respect to time, with respect to x of all this object is u. And I'm not going to tell you why that is the case. Uh, I will just comment a little bit of the, on the form of this. So this u, 1 minus u, is a function which looks like this. And that U is a density, and this whole thing is called a flux, how much stuff actually gets through this, this traffic problem. And what you realize is that this, if you, if you increase density all the way up to like a half here, then you get more flux. So if you push more of these polymerase, more cars through, through the highway, you get more cars through. But once you reach a critical density, like half in this picture, then you push more cars, they actually get stuck. You get less flux out. Right? So this nonlinear behavior, which is reflected here, <coughs> is <coughs> reflecting the, the fact that there's a, there's a traffic jam. Okay. And this is actually a traffic flow model from the 50s, the, the, you know, which, which we can so. then we uh, then we start interrogating this model. And interrogation um, takes place. So I'm telling you already that in this u1 minus u. Uh, is hidden, the kind of the density uh, tells you that things, the, the traffic jams are in there. The red lights, the pauses, <coughs> are introduced through this, through this beta, 
which is kind of this function here. This is a function of space and time. And every one of these blue dots, think about it as being a barrier. It's a place where my beta, which is kind of like a, this is the hopping rate, this is how quickly I move through that position, is zero. I can't move through it. This is like a, here's a start of the red light, here's the end of the red light. So green light, green light is all the white, and red lights are all the blue things. Right? So they go in time, they go up and down, this is time, at certain position, a pause starts, okay? a red light. So if you start to, and you can now numerically evaluate this differential equation with this kind of beta. So is this data or is this magic? This is magic. So, okay. Magic. It is, it is data in the following sense because those pauses are uh, random and we know the distribution. I go in and just generate from that distribution something which is, which is like that. Right? But this is, you, can, you should think about it as being a random field which has to be changed multiple times. Um, this is how it looks like if you, if you simulate it. Um, again, space, time. Here's a little, this is a little red light over here. And up is the density. Right? So what this means is that there's an kind of overall density coming in of things are moving in. Some of them run into a red light. There's a, this is a back, uh, backing out of the polymerase of the, of, the, of the line of cars or something standing in a red light. While at the time it releases, this is a, a clear map of the, of the red light uh, uh, backed up traffic. So these kind of pictures you can produce numerically. And here's my final slide of what, what, can we, what we currently have as a result in kind of for biology, perhaps, is that um, if you take the data, which is data for regular gene, how often these pauses happen, how long they are on average. Uh, you look at how the hopping rate, how big the hopping rate possibly could be. And this is way higher than people think they should. This is a beta. They refer, 90 is kind of the upper limit they, they, they talk about. Okay? This is saying, I am going to, if I have a polymerase on an empty slot, we'll go 90 base pairs in one second. Okay? That's really high. 45 is normal cells. This particular uh, gene, they talk about 90. I'm trying to say, okay, let's put all these pauses in, all the trapping in which we observe. Can we get to observe 60 seconds? Okay. 60 seconds is the time of crossing of these things. And what you see here is that I can't. This is 20, 50, 20, 40 seconds. These are all the green dots are different pause distributions. Right? So these are five different trials, if you want, random trials. The red dots are the averages. I should be at 60 seconds, which is like a floor below this. Okay? This is four times as much. So again, my model fails. So if you assume measure density of pauses and the length of pauses on a regular gene, <coughs> we're far away from 60 seconds. So some assumptions might be wrong, right? The main, uh, the main, <laughs> I'm like to fail, okay? Uh, the main conclusion that we can do is either the number of these of length of pauses are different from the regular gene to this gene. Okay. They are just less pauses, and, or they are less, they are, they are, uh, uh, they are shorter. There's some evidence for that, that people know uh, that there are these so-called stopping places, you know, there's, there's kind of long, long pauses, termination sites in that genome, and they know that the polymerase gets modified. There's like this piece of the RNA which, which you already transcribed can hook on the mRNA, and then it's somehow faster. It was never uh, measured for this particular, for these short ubiquitous pauses, which we're talking about. Uh, but that's what the model predicts. Right? There's, there's some, there must be some modification. This guy has to run faster, should not stop this long. So that's the, <coughs> that's the hypothesis here, which we propose, and we need experiments to, to, to verify that. OK. I have a few minutes. So I call this successes, even though if our model failed twice, okay? uh, but we can learn something from this. So here is here is something which I would like to just kind of leave with leave with you in terms of complex systems and analysis of complex systems. Uh, and all I'm going to talk about is a number of variables, a number of differential equations. Right? If I look at uh, number of genes which can interact to cause cancer, it's not one gene. That we, we, all the diseases which are caused by one gene, we, we, we know basically. Right? 
But these diseases, which are complex diseases where you have genes which are a little bit off balance, but there's hundreds of them, a little bit off, off kilter, and they, it's hard to figure out that they actually cause them, right? It's, it's, it's very complex. Uh, thousands of microbes interact to form microbiome. Models of the atmosphere, right? You, you make a model of Earth, of, of the atmospheric, uh, oops, that's fine. Uh, usually, this is kind of the best models we have. You make a thousand by thousand of squares of the Earth's surface, and you show and you kind of, that's one pressure variable, a bunch of variables, pressure, temperature, something, and then they interact with next squares. Well, how many squares of that size are on the Earth's surface? I don't know, hundreds, thousands, right? <coughs> how do we study this, these systems? I would like to ask a very simple question, and this is a question of how many attractors a system like this has. Okay, so let me try to explain what is a tractor of the system. Um, you can think of, you know, we have a continental divide here close to us. So think about the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean as two resting places for a drop of rain. Right? If you drop right here, we go to, to, to Atlantic. If you go on the view, we go to Pacific. I'm ignoring the undergrounds and stuff like that, okay? Uh, so that is my picture of the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean, okay? And so there's a divide in the middle, and this is the attractor for this for the rain to go one way or the other. So think about the attractor that way. Uh, Lake Missoula, I don't even know this story probably. This is a few years, you know, a few years ago. Uh, what happened is that this is this is a lake which which was dammed by a glacier right, multiple times, uh, and then when the glacier melted, suddenly the whole lake was released right, and it went crazy. So what is that? If you think about it as being a Pacific Ocean, there's a Lake Missoula. The glacier in the middle. It slowly melts, so this thing, this divide kind of gets a little weaker and weaker. And, some, and, and this is a very slow change. And if you're a fish living in that lake, you have no idea there's a Pacific Ocean. You're happy, right? You live as a clam, suddenly, <laughs> and, and you're out, right? So this, this, this is actually an important point here uh, that if you have a single attractor in a big system, then most likely the slow changes in the parameters will cause cause slow change to behavior. So let me, this is like this, right? You have a, you know, a single attractor, there's, that's where you are. That's your, you know, you change a little bit this thing and you kind of, you just move a little bit left and a little bit right and your system is not, it's kind of predictable. If you have the multiple attractors, <coughs> you can have slow changes causing catastrophic fast changes in the behavior, right? So if I have, if I'm sitting in this spot here and things are changing, so like my leg is up, suddenly I just go, right? because that's not anymore an attractor, and you move off. Now, this uh, could be a complex and hard problem, for instance, for an atmosphere, right? Uh, like, I like to kind of focus on that one because I want to finish. If, if you have, if you look at our atmospheric models, and there is a current state, which is attracting because we're in it, but maybe, you know, a little bit behind some divide, there's another, uh, state, which is which is complete rearrangement of sea currents, Gulf Stream is non-existent. You know things are completely different, and it's sitting there. Right? If we started our Earth in a different initial condition, we would have been there. If was, we were a different raindrop, well, we're not. We are right here. But if there is one in our models, that's a very dangerous thing because we could be very close to where the divide is going to tilt, and we will go within 100 years from where we are to this place, and in that place. You know, Europe is going to be under ice, or it will be a hot house, or something, right? The problem. So, can we actually figure out if, in these high-dimensional models, there's one or two attractors? It's kind of a simple thing to do, right? Because let's have two variables. I can just take uh, one of those variables and start from one to 100. Values of one to 100. Every one, I just kind of start these, those values. So I have another one. I just make more notches. And then uh, I start my differential equation, my model, at 100 by 100 initial conditions. I start them and watch where they are. If they go to all to one place, it's probably the way more attractive. Not really sure, but probably. Right? So there's, this is what we should do. Um, now, there's two fundamental issues with this. One is, if I find if I find two initial conditions that they go to, the, to different places, Pacific and Atlantic Ocean, I know I have two attractors. I'm done. But if they go to the same place, maybe I 
should make a little more matches and start with different initial conditions. I should go someplace else and start with it. I don't know where this where these attractors should be. The second and more fundamental problem with this approach, if I have 200 variables, which is small, we have a complex system with thousands of variables. If I try to find these initial conditions and start with every single one of them, uh, here's the number of simulations. Uh, that's a possible number. Uh, we, can't, we can't do this. Supercomputers will not do anything with this. Right? We, will not, we cannot grow our supercomputers to if you don't touch this. So this is one of the places where we need some new ideas. Right? And, and, and one should realize when you hear things about, you know, oh, we have the genomes and we, have, we can do these things in big complex systems, we cannot even figure out in a fully dimensional system of very, very simplified climate model if there's one or two attractions. And that's the, that's the problem. OK, so here's my conclusion. I'm done. Um, so bath Nagamalik provides somehow standardized ways to study analogy. Right? And I'm saying, oh, look, this looks like a, like a traffic model. Let me look at the traffic model. There's, there's a connection between them because the equations are the same. Um, we talk about some successes, HIV, simply consortia, transcriptional modeling. We talk about you know, some of these multiple levels in this pyramid, about viruses, about metabolism, about different things. Um, and finally, we touched a little bit on this problem with complex systems. Right? There's some fundamental issues which are very difficult to, to address. And so I'd like to, I think this is what legal, I think. I'd like to find my, you know, thank my, my sponsors over the years. This is actually current grants, I think, over the last few years. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>